I come from a, a NLP background and then transitioned a little bit into the game theory, so kind of uh, maybe the yeah, other direction as to uh, compared to a lot of other people. And so I'm um, excited to be here. And um, um, today I'm going to talk about uh, some of the work um, that we did in building strategic language agents um, using game theory and language models. And before I start, I want to acknowledge that much of the work that I'll talk about today was done jointly with a bunch of different uh, amazing collaborators across a number of different domains and institutions. And some of them are actually here. You have uh, Minet and uh, Gabriele. Um, and uh, this is a kind of a long-term effort. I'm excited to talk about it here. Um, and with that, let's get started. So uh, for the nth time, uh, uh, Everyone knows language models are great, and uh, uh, they're also evolving at a breakneck pace, um, even as compared to a year ago. And uh, they also perform really well on a number of different tasks, from ranging from code generation to um, kind of uh, discourse and uh, dialogue generation, among other things. But and they're far from perfectly reliable. Um, and there's increasing evidence that as you scale LMs, um, they actually grow more prone to generating false but frequently repeated statements um, with increasing scale. And there's also evidence by a number of situations where people have gotten in trouble for, from relying on these systems a bit too much. And further complicating matters, uh, in domains that require reasoning, like games of tic-tac-toe that Coase just mentioned earlier, and even for those that require agent-like behavior, um, such as chatbot assistance, these models don't do well by not being able to reason. And this even leads to them going completely off, uh, off script, as some of these examples show. And at the same time, over the past few decades, we, we have seen that you know, AI has achieved tremendous success in a lot of strategic domains, like chess, Go, and poker. Um, but again, a lot of these successes have been limited to purely competitive games or two-player games, or especially games with no language. And so a few years ago, we set out to tackle um, the task of building a language-based AI um, uh, for a multi-agent domain where there's both a cooperative element and a competitive element, and where doing well uh, requires strategic use of language. And the domain we settled on um, it was the game of diplomacy. Um, diplomacy is a seven-player game where uh, it has combinatorially large action spaces, and doing well requires both cooperation and competition with other players on the, um, in the game. And one where players must cooperate, negotiate, trust, and support each other using natural language dialogue, while also competing for as much territory as possible. Um, the objective of the game is to control the majority of the map on the game board. And the game is set in Europe, um, with each of the players controlling one of the seven major powers. And the, ga the game is specifically divided into phases. Um, at the beginning of each phase, players negotiate alliances using language in during, with one-on-one -on -one, uh, private conversations. And at the end, all the players simultaneously play an action. Um, and specifically, the only way to win at this game is by building trust, negotiating, and cooperating with other players. And so at a high level, um, we can decompose diplomacy as one with uh, two main components. You have a strategic reasoning component. Um, we have a strategic reasoning component um, and a dialogue modeling component. The rest of this talk is uh, focused on our effort towards building an AI to play this game. And I'll talk through some of our key challenges in, uh, while tackling this domain. And first, I'll talk about how we can build a strategic AI uh, to play a multi uh, to play in a multi agent domain with humans. And in the second part of the talk, I'll describe our work on building strategic agents can, that can not only act but also communicate uh, with other players on the game board. And I'll also describe how all of this effort um, helped, at, uh, helped us uh, build um, an AI to play the game of diplomacy called Cicero. And finally, I will end with the highlight of some of our recent work, leverage, leveraging a lot of these insights um, for building better models of human language, and as well as for improving language models. A popular variant of the game 
um, like I mentioned earlier, is called no press diplomacy, which does not uh, permit explicit communication on the game board. Um, however, implicit communication with uh, moves on the board is still permitted. This is still a very challenging game, uh, but it enables us to focus on just the strategic element of the game. Now, what are the specific characteristics you need to do well in no press diplomacy? It requires uh, the agent to be able to tactically outplay opponents in two-player zero-sum situations, the ability to effectively cooperate, the ability to signal intents, and even the ability to seem human, and the ability to determine when to be change alliances. And all these aspects makes this domain a really great place to study strategic reasoning in a human-centric environment. And so, how do we build such an agent? One way to build an agent is through imitation learning. That is, you take a data set of human games that consists of states, S, and join actions, A bar, uh, that these players played. And then you can use supervised learning to train an imitation learn policy uh, the neural network. But as we'll soon see, although this agent is able to imitate human behavior and even signal intents in a human-like way, uh, the agent is poor in terms of its long-term tactics, cooperation, and its ability to coordinate. So how do we improve uh, uh, an AI um, on the other fronts? An approach that we use to improve uh, the performance is using an inference time search. And to do this, we first model the game as a repeated simultaneous action game. Suppose we are in a particular phase of the game. We can consider all possible joint actions of the seven players. But this is where we hit our first hurdle. There are combinatorially many such joint actions, and it's uh, not very tractable. And so in our work, we first uh, train a proposal policy, tau, that identifies the most promising candidates, um, joint action candidates for each of the players. Then uh, we can use a game engine to transition, uh, transition the to find the states that these actions trans transitions the game to. And finally, we can uh, evaluate the new state using a value function that, is, that we train on human data. So now, with the proposal policies and the value function, what we get is a seven-dimensional payoff grid. Now, how do we find a strong policies in this setting? And to answer this question, we'll take a brief detour to the domain of simultaneous action games that almost everyone here is super familiar with but we'll specifically look at a simpler version, which is two-player zero-sum games. And what does this look like? You start in a state S, where you have two policies, pi 1 and pi 2, and they simultaneously perform an action, R and C. And they receive a reward of Q1 and Q2, which sum to zero. And folks uh, know pretty well, uh, these games are often described by a payoff matrix, like the one shown here. More formally, we can define uh, ui of pi 1 and pi 2 to be the expected utility obtained by player i when player 1 plays pi 1 and player 2 plays pi 2. Now, what is the optimal solution in these games? Again, uh, I don't need to t say this to the folks here, but um, a good solution here is the Nash equilibrium. Recall that the Nash equilibrium is a joint policy where no player is incentivized to unilaterally deviate uh, by playing a different policy. And an algorithm of finding Nash equilibria in two players or some games is Hedge. Um, we won't go into the details, which, but I'm sure most of, most of you are familiar with it anyways. Um, but informally, Hedge is an iterative algorithm that uh, where the probability of playing an action is uh, proportional to the exponential of the cumulative utility of, um, of, of the actions on all previous iterations, where eta being a parameter that depends on um, the iteration. At the end, the average strategy of the players produced by hedge is known to converge to a, a Nash equilibrium. Now, coming back to the seven player simultaneous action game that we had, we can use um, hedge that takes in the imitation learned proposal policy and the imitation learned value function, to, uh, th which are trained from the human play data set, to find improved policy for each of the players. But are we done? 
Here we consider a plot that on the x-axis considers the human action prediction accuracy. That is the top one accuracy of predicting human moves. And the y-axis, we measure the strength of the agent. First, we have the search methods, um, hedge and regret matching. Regret matching is just another iterative algorithm for finding Nash equilibria in this setting. They get a pretty high score of 47%. Now, like mentioned at the beginning of the talk, the human imitation learn policy, on the other hand, gets a much higher prediction accuracy, but a lot lower score. Now, note that uh, the search-based policies uh, have a lot lower prediction accuracy. And so, um, although these search-based agents may be strong tactically uh, and in pursuing self-interest, they are unfortunately uh, not as good on other fronts. And so a question we set out to answer is how we can build an agent that gets the best of both imitation learning and search. And we develop an algorithm called Pickle, um, or policy regress hedge. Um, to be more concrete, suppose we have an imitation learned uh, anchor policy that we wish to regularize the utilities um, that we saw earlier towards. And we can do this by adding a kill regularization penalty um, to hedge. And that has a lambda parameter that, depend, that controls the strength, strength of that penalty. Now, our per iteration policy, policy needs to be adjusted to be consistent um, and sound given the new definition of the utility. Now, this is the policy we had before, and we updated to the following. A new policy is updated not just based on the cumulative utility of the action, but something proportional to the log of the anchor policy uh, tau. Again, I'm not going to go into the detail here, but notice as lambda tends to zero, this is, this is just regular hedge iteration, and as lambda tends to infinity, this converges to playing the anchor policy tau. Uh, in our paper last year, we show that this, the average policy is produced by pickle hedge, kind of stays close to the anchor policy, and uh, it can also produce strong policies. And I, skip again, I again skip over a lot of the details, but I invite you to take a look at the paper or come after the talk to chat more. Now recall that hedge takes in a human imitation learned proposal policy and an imitation learned value function that are learned from the human play data set to find strong policies for the agents. With pickle hedge, we use the same proposal policies and value function, but we also take a lambda parameter and uh, human imitation learned anchor policies. Generally, these, uh, the anchor policies and the proposal policies are kept the same. Here we have the plot from before. And in green, we have pickle hedge with different values of the lambda parameter. Um, now, with lambda equal to 0.1, um, you obtain a policy that gets a much higher uh, performance relative to imitation learning while also maintaining, um, uh, maintaining the human action prediction score. And that leads us to our no press diplomacy agent that we call Diplodocus. It combines a pickle-based search algorithm and puts that into a seven-player seven -player, self -player reinforcement learning loop. And we entered Diplodocus variants into an anonymous tournament that featured over 60 participants uh, that included players of different st skill levels, including experts. And every game featured one of our agents and six human participants. And Diplodocus was able to successfully outperform all participants who played at least five games. And so by leveraging equilibrium search, regularized towards an imitation learn policy, as well as reinforcement learning, um, we are able to build an agent that is strong on multiple fronts. So now we have a strong strategic AI that can play uh, expert human level in the version of diplomacy without language. But we're only halfway there. Uh, recall that the full game involves private one-on-one -on -one conversation between players on the, game, on, on the game board. Now, how do we build an uh, AI agent that not only requires strategic reasoning, but also building trust, negotiating, um, and cooperating with other players using uh, natural language dialogue? Like before, we could start uh, with human data um, and train an imitation learn agent that is conditioned on the board state and the dialogue history to first predict the policies of the agent 
And then uh, we can simultaneously train an imitation learning agent to predict the dialogue for the agent. But like before, imitation learning alone cannot match the performance of strong humans. And dialogue models or language models uh, trained with imitation learning can be easily exploited. For example, you could tell the agent, I'm glad we agreed that you will move your unit out of Paris. And since similar messages only happened in the training data when an agreement was reached, the, uh, the imitation learning agent indeed moves its unit out of Paris, even if doing so was a strategic blunder. So we already seen how we can improve strategic policies using Pickle. But how might we improve the dialogue model? And we could potentially use some form of self-play reinforcement learning. But unlike the strategic, strategic action spaces, uh, the natural language action space is incredibly challenging. There are huge and language generation is slow. Um, there's also a very complex credit assignment problem. Even if th those problems weren't complex enough, uh, you have the problem of language drift, which is when agents that are in self-play reinforcement learning loop uh, <laughs> tend to co-adapt and develop new meanings for uh, natural language strings. Um, and so in, we instead use a form of intent control dialogue, uh, dialogue generation. What does this look like? First, we train uh, an intent model to predict for a pair of eight players on the basis of the dialogue and both say's history um, to predict the actions for those agents by fine tuning a, a language model. Then we use this model to annotate uh, each message in the dialogue, uh, dialogue training data set with an agreement message injected at the end. Now we can train a language model to predict uh, each data set message uh, given the annotated intent of the target message. In doing so, the language model we just trained is now controllable with a set of intents. Now with this intent conditional language model, we can do something interesting. Uh, we just saw earlier that using pickle-based search, we can produce much better policies. So what we can do is use a pickle-based search algorithm to generate better intents for this intent model. And we can condition the language model on this better set of strategic intents to produce better dialogue. And this approach addresses many of the challenges that I mentioned earlier while employing the, uh, keeping the quality of the dialogue uh, good. Now let us look at the intent model in action. Now if the intent is that France helps England move to Belgium, um, kind of England generates a message suggesting that move. Similarly, on the other hand, if uh, intent uh, is that England supports France's move to Belgium, uh, our England agent uh, sends, generates a message that asks France if they want uh, England's help. So the pickle-based planner that we saw in the first part of the talk and combined with this intent conditional dialogue component, as well as a bunch of other things that I haven't touched on, uh, form the pieces of our human level diplomacy AI. Um, and now I'll do a quick overview of how all the things we saw here kind of fit together. Suppose we are in a particular phase of the game with the board state and a dialogue history. We, uh, we feed this into a dialogue conditional language model um, that produces actions and policies similar to the intent language model we saw earlier. And these anchor policies are then fed into a pickle-based planning module. And these, this planning module produces a strong, stronger set of strategic intents that the language model um, is conditioned on in order to produce the output messages. And now each time our agent Cicero receives new messages from any player, uh, it reruns this whole planning pipeline. And when the phase ends, it plays the, uh, the intent that it had at that point in time. I skipped over a lot of the details, um, but I suggest you take a look at that paper and uh, that were all very crucial to kind of making this work. And as many of you might already know, uh, we entered Cicero into an anonymous uh, diplomacy league where it achieved more than double the average score of the human players and ranked in the top 10% of players uh, who played more than one game. And uh, when players were informed about the game, they were quite surprised to hear, th uh, hear that they actually played with an AI. 
And so in this talk, we looked at how we might be able to build a strategic language agent for the game of diplomacy. In the first part of the talk, I, we looked at how we can build an AI that can act strategically in a human-centric multi-agent domain by regularizing game theoretic search towards the imitation learn policy. In the second part of the talk, we showed how leveraging an intent-based language model with this regularized search allowed us to build Cicero, our human-level diplomacy AI. And before I wrap up, I briefly touch, want to touch on some of our new and upcoming work where we show that many of the things that we developed here can actually be extended to domains outside of board games. First, uh, we study human language use. Um, and in our upcoming work, we develop a game theoretic, theoretic framework that can explain how communicative context affects meaning as well as or better than many of the approaches used in linguistics. And we are hoping this work further bridges the effort in linguistics and game theory to better understand human communication. And next in a paper that's now on archive, we show that language model generation can be improved sometimes significantly across several NLP tasks by casting language model generation as a form of signaling game between two agents. Um, and together, these kind of uh, works highlight the promise of game theoretic tools for better understanding human communication as well as for improving language models. Again, I want to take the time to acknowledge and thank all of these amazing people without whom these projects would not have been possible. And thank you for listening. Um, I'll let Roma set up. Meanwhile, we can take me two questions. Yes. So just a quick question about diplomacy to help me think about this. Is there randomness in the game, and is there private information on the part of the player? Yes, uh, there's no randomness. So if, uh, if everyone plays the game at the same time, um, um, it gets executed simultaneously. But there is private information in that uh, players uh, tend to kind of uh, converse in one-on-one -on -one situations. And so uh, you have no idea what two other players might have agreed on. And so there's the private but there's no dice and there's no cards. That's right. I'm, I'm curious about the data that you have here. And, um, you know, like one, how much dialogue do you actually do you have that you can make use of? And two, I'm wondering, do you find any like sort of individual differences in how uh, people choose to communicate? Yeah, so what we do is we take an off-the-shelf uh, kind of BART-based language model, which we fine tune our, on our language data set. So it's not large enough that you can train a really good language model out of just the data set. I think it's roughly a couple hundred thousand kind of uh, conversations. Um, and as it relates to one of the key things that we learned early on is that people have very specific ways in which they communicate in kind of chat interfaces, which is very different from, let's say, if you plugged in a GPT-4. People are going to identify that it's an uh, AI just because it does not have that style of dialogue that people expect when they play these games. Um, about, about what to do next. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, uh, that's kind of one of the key interesting challenges. Uh, people kind of end up kind of disagreeing and uh, kind of that adds a lot of drama, but yeah. Okay, I think let's take the answer. Questions up. 